The famous comedian Minnie Pearl told a story about two wealthy brothers who cheated and swindled and disrespected and mistreated everyone they did business with throughout their lives. And then one day, one of the brothers died and the other was left to arrange his funeral. So the surviving brother went to the local pastor and said he'd donate $500,000 to the pastor's church if he would say that his brother was a saint during the funeral. The pastor said, all I have to do is work in the words, he was a saint? Yes, that's all the brother said, and they shook hands on the deal, and the brother handed the preacher a check. The funeral was packed on the day, and with people curious as to what the preacher was going to say about this swindling brother who cheated so many people in town, and if he'd follow through on the deal that many had known he had made. But the preacher was a man of his word, and he began by saying in his eulogy, as you know, the deceased man was a person who cheated and swindled and disrespected and mistreated everyone he ever did business with. But compared to his brother, he was a real saint. We are celebrating All Saints Sunday today in the midst of an apocalypse of biblical proportions. An apocalypse brought on by a plague as devastating as any described in scripture. Nine million Americans have been infected and 230,000 have died. And as we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses on All Saints Sunday, those who have gone on to be with God, we remember those that we have lost to COVID-19, our own beloved members, and all the loved ones we've lost in the last year. It's fitting that during this apocalypse of 2020, that we meditate on those extraordinary words of comfort in the apocalypse of John. These are the saints, John said, who have come out of the great ordeal. Their robes have been washed and made clean in the blood of the Lamb. They will hunger no more, thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor the scorching heat, for the Lamb on the throne will be their shepherd and guide them in springs of living water where God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. As people of faith, this is our hope and our prayer for all that we have lost and for ourselves as well. We hope and pray that when our time on this earth is complete, that we will join with all the saints who have come before us and enter into God's kingdom of peace and rest where there is no more hunger or thirst or toiling under the sun, no more violence or pain or suffering. May it be so for us, for all who have gone before us and for all who will come after us. Yet as we meditate on the beautiful apocalyptic vision of John, we do well to remember that an apocalypse, as you have heard me say before, does not mean the end of life or the end of history or the end of the world. It may be the end of the world as we know it. But the word apocalypse means a great unveiling or uncovering of what was already here but hidden from our eyes. So to experience an apocalypse is to experience a radical shift in our worldview. It's like being given a new prescription or a new pair of glasses. And once we see the world through these lenses so clearly with these new apocalyptic lenses, we will never see it the same way again. And yet, mysteriously, we have the choice about what to do with this apocalypse. It's up to us to decide if we will wear these new lenses. In the movie, The Matrix, the main character, Neo, is offered a choice between a red pill and a blue pill by the rebel leader, Morpheus. The red pill represents a future that would free Neo from the enslaving control of a machine-generated dream world and allow him to enter into the real world. But of course, reality is much harsher and more difficult. The blue pill, on the other hand, represents a beautiful prison that would allow Neo to go back into ignorance, to live in the comfort within the simulation of the matrix. It's a choice between living in the reality and the revelation of an unpleasant truth or remaining in blissful ignorance. Morpheus famously says to Neo, you take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and you believe whatever you wanna believe. You take the red pill and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Neo chose the red pill, chose to face reality, and joined the rebellion. 
Neo's choice reminds me of a conversation Thomas Merton had with his Jewish friend Robert Lax in the late 1930s, shortly after Merton converted to Catholicism. While they're walking the streets of New York, Robert asked Merton what he wanted to be now that he had become a Catholic. Merton replied, I don't know, I guess I want to be a good Catholic. Robert stopped him in his tracks and said, what you should have said is you want to become a saint. Merton was dumbfounded and asked, how do, how do you expect me to become a saint? Robert replied, all that is necessary to become a saint is to want to be one. All you have to do is desire it. Merton was never officially canonized as a saint by the Catholic Church, but he did become a saint for all practical purposes. And late in life, he once said, for me to be a saint is simply to be myself. The problem of sanctity and salvation, in fact, turns out to be the problem of finding out who I really am, discovering my true self, my true identity. We often think about sainthood in two polar opposite and unproductive ways. We either imagine that everyone who dies becomes a saint, or that only those extra special, super spiritual, holy people who are monks and martyrs get to be saints. This, of course, leaves the rest of us ordinary people off the hook for ever having to worry about it. Maybe the problem is the word saint. It seems too spiritual or religious, holier than thou, self-righteous, too separate and distant from the quotidian reality that most of us live in with work and relationships, parenting, walking the dog, feeding the cat, cooking dinner, doing dishes and laundry, grocery shopping, mowing the lawn, and paying the bills. But there are many heroes who operate in the radical ordinary of everyday life. Lately, I've been wondering if maybe we need to get rid of the word saint and stop trying to be so spiritual and holy and employ a new term or imagine something like good ancestor. What does it mean to be a good ancestor? I borrowed this term from Leigh Lassad, who wrote the best-selling book, Me and White Supremacy, and hosts the Good Ancestor podcast. Layla says that the idea of becoming a good ancestor was something that she'd seen others talk about. And when she read Octavia Butler's books, The Parable of the Sower and The Parable of the Talents, she was inspired to adopt the term as a vision for her life. Today, Layla's work is driven by the powerful desire to become a good ancestor, by which she means to live and work in ways that leave a legacy of healing and liberation for those who will come after we are gone. Layla claims nobody alive today created white supremacy, and yet we're living with the legacy of it, and it's a heavy legacy. So how do we come out from under that? How do we create a different future, a different legacy for the next generation? For Layla, creating a legacy of healing and liberation is the way to become a good ancestor. Layla is not the only person with this vision. Philosopher Roman Krznarak has given TED Talks and speeches calling the people of the earth to become good ancestors, or what he also names long-term thinkers and time rebels, who participate in a movement that redefines lifespans by pursuing what he calls intergenerational justice through the practice of deep love for our planet. Unlike Layla, whose vision is focused on liberating the future from white supremacy, Krznarak's vision is focused on liberating the future from ecological extinction. He uses the example of Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine in 1953, but refused to patent it, foregoing tons of profit so that more lives could actually be saved. His radical generosity to the future should inspire us. However, when we look at the mindset of most people today, Kersnarek claims that we are suffering from a pathology of short-term thinking, an exploitative mindset of immediate culture, consumer, capitalism that has colonized the future. So Kersnarek offers a host of practical ways that we can retrain our brains to take the long view, including what he calls deep time humility, which recognizes that our lives are just a cosmic blink of the eye. And also what you might have heard of as cathedral thinking, which starts projects that will take more than our lifetime to complete. 
His aim is to inspire more time rebels like Greta Thunberg to shift our allegiance from this generation to all of humanity, to extend our horizons beyond our own lives, to take care of the place where our descendants will live, and in short, to save our planet and our future. In his apocalyptic vision, John said, After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and all peoples and all languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, with palm branches in their hands, they cried out in a loud voice, Liberation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels around the throne, with the elders and the four living creatures, fell on their faces and worshipped God with singing. And then one of the elders said, Who are these and where have they come from? And I said to him, Sir, only you know. Then he said, these are those who have come out of the great ordeal. The great multitude in John's vision is an international, intertribal, interethnic, interracial, intergenerational, and multilingual community. It is a beloved community with no hunger, no thirst, no labor, no inequality, no violence, no pain, no suffering. It is a vision for a future free of white supremacy or any division a world free of ecological disaster. It's a future where people live and flourish together in harmony and wholeness with God, their neighbors, and all of creation, drinking from springs of clean living water. The question that the apocalypse of John and the apocalypse of 2020 beg us to ask ourselves is, if a great multitude of international peace and a beloved community of justice equity and rest is our vision of the future, then how should we live in the present? If one of our descendants or someone from a future generation were to travel back in time from the future to talk to us today, what would they say to us? What would they tell us to do? What would they teach us about what it means to be a good ancestor? The truth is that if we can imagine a different future, then we can live differently in the present. Loving our neighbor not only means loving the saints who have come before us and the saints who live with us in the present, it also means loving our great, great, great grandchildren, our descendants, and all future generations of people who will come to live on this earth long after we are gone. Loving them and the planet that they will inherit with all of our heart, mind, body, and strength is what it means to be a good ancestor. The great spiritual mystic of the Black Freedom Movement, Howard Thurman, told a story of a time when he was a small child walking through the neighborhood where he grew up. One day, he saw a very old man, close to 90 years of age, struggling to plant a new tree. Howard Thurman was a smart and precocious child, and he called out to the old man and said, Sir, why are you working so hard to plant that tree? You'll be dead and gone long before it ever grows up or produces any fruit. The old man said, son, all my life, I've been eating the fruit of trees that somebody else planted. So I'm planting this tree in honor of those who planted trees that kept me from growing hungry. And even though I'll never see the fruit, I'm planting this tree for the sake of those who will come after me. So they too will have something to eat. We are all God's saints, holy Blessed, beloved. But the question is, will we choose to live our lives in such a way that we become good ancestors as well? Amen.